Welcome to the Voice of San Diego at Home. I am Scott Lewis. It is August 7, 2020. Uh, in this strange pandemic time, I'm again in my garage. Going to get a better backdrop. Stop yelling at me. We're going to get a better backdrop. Uh, <laughs> just, you know, let the chaos. This is just the, the representative of the chaotic, chaotic time that we are in. Um, and uh, I've got a great show. We are going to talk later with Morgan Appel. He's the assistant dean at the Education and Community Outreach Department of UC San Diego Extension. They are doing a lot of work to try to help teachers and districts get ready for this remote learning reality that we are all so excited for, very excited for. Ah, Got a lot to talk about, a little loopy tonight. It's Friday. Let's have some fun. If you have any questions, let me know. If I can't answer them, I'll let the let the people know. Maybe they can answer them. If you have any ideas, if you want to call me a failed cult leader, <laughs> that works too. That was a good comment. Um, all right, let's get into some news though. Uh, I was, as you know, we've been tracking this not school revolution that's happening. These new private pop-ups that are proliferating across the community uh, as parents seek out alternatives so they can still have jobs and functioning lives and, and have their kids uh, be doing some uh, some distance learning with the help of other guides. We've been following our, uh, if you haven't read that story, Will Huntsbury did this week, fascinating roundup of everything that's happening. Coronado, where they're actually going to have uh, on campuses, on school campuses, uh, a nonprofit running a day camp to help with distance learning. <laughs> ah, a lot going on there. Uh, one of those that we were following was St. Therese Academy in the Del, Del Cerro area. They announced that they were going to do a day camp of this type of you know distance learning, but we'll take care of your kids at the same time, maybe not so distantly. Fascinating end around around uh, what, what's being allowed and not, you know, you can have childcare right now, can't have schools, but if you do childcare at schools. So St. Therese Academy, they got vetoed. Dear St. Therese Academy families, this came out this week. As always, it's a pleasure to serve you. I regret to inform you that today, that today our bishop, our plans for a camp were rejected by the bishop in a diocesan, is that how you say it? Wide consultation with all Catholic schools. He stated unequivocally that no parish or school may operate a camp because it was illegal to do so, as our day camp would be in operation when our local public school district, San Diego Unified, would be in session. Our position was that our children attending day camp was not in conflict with his judgment regarding the law. So the principle they're talking about there is that you're not allowed to run a day camp when schools are in session. And even though schools aren't in session physically, the way that San Diego Unified has decided and other districts have started to decide is that they were going to do basically a six-hour schedule. Even if the teacher won't be plugged in with the students six hours a day or whatever, they were going to have a schedule of the sort. And so you can't have a day camp during that period. Will Huntsbury, on our site, had uh, found the same thing out, you know, and pointed out that there were going to be some of these legal problems with some of these day camp ideas. For instance, some of them have to be licensed childcare in order to provide these kinds of day camp services. Not all of them are. And then this other restriction, can they operate during the day when schools are supposed to be happening? Well, maybe if they're doing childcare, and helping with the distance learning that these kids are already plugged into. So that fascinating development right there, a diocesan wide consultation, a diocesan wide consultation, he stated unequivocally, no parish or school may operate a camp because it was illegal to do so. Illegal. Uh, I also saw Boys and Girls Club in San Marcos offering $79 a week for their distance learning centers. Distance. Learning centered. So you can still have a, a, a not distance from there. Fascinating time in education. We're going to talk with Morgan Appel from UC San Diego Extension about how he's helping teachers and students handle this. One other note on schools, well, a couple other notes. 
the waiver process. So one of the things the governor said is, hey, you can't open schools in some of these counties that have these bad rates and stuff of COVID-19 back or uh, infection rates. But you can, in those counties, apply for a waiver for kinder or for kindergarten through sixth grade for schools that have kindergarten through sixth grade or whatever below that. San Diego Unified made it clear they're not going to apply for that waiver. There was some pressure on Poway Unified to apply for waivers for its elementaries. Not going to do it. They decided to wait no matter what happens until January. But we've all been waiting to see what happens with some of the charter schools and with some of the private schools, whether they would apply for that. This week, we learned that the county would be the one to decide that. And they laid out the process. They said, you can apply for the waiver. The county will consider it. The county will send it to the state for advice. The state will send back its advice. And then the uh, county public health officer, Wilma Wooten, will decide whether you can open your own elementary schools or not. We are all on the edge of our seats to see how many of those schools I am. I'm on the edge of my seat, almost falling off. How many of those schools will apply? How many of those districts will apply? How many of the charter schools will apply? How many of the private schools will apply? What their applications will look like about the things they're doing to keep the kids safe? And then what the county will actually decide. The Board of Supervisors decided to support the process, but they don't get to actually decide on each of these individual schools or uh, charter schools or private schools that are applying. So we'll see exactly what happens with that. That'll be uh really interesting oh great the dogs can still bark fascinating life at home is wonderful all right um uh uh one last point on on schools saint augustine academy that's saint augustine that's in south park park it's a high school it decided to sue the governor for what um, uh, the governor did about closing schools. So we will see if it's uh, if it's um, uh, <laughs> if it's lawsuit gets somewhere with that. Hold, just a, shh, stop it. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, uh, on uh, one last point on hospitalizations. This is the key uh, the one that I've been following. This is hospitalizations of COVID-19 related patients. Um, that has been going down. This is a great indicator for our community. This was up at 500 just a few weeks ago, three, four weeks ago. Uh, we were seeing 500 patients in local hospitals with COVID-19. Uh, and now it has gone down steadily, steadily, steadily down to 354 uh, yesterday. So great developments there. Very pleased with that indicator. Uh, we're having our own COVID-19 scare in, in my family. Hopefully it is nothing. All right, last point. Big meeting this week at the San Diego City Hall about this building. Quick summary. Quick summary. That's 101 Ash Street. 101 Ash Street used to be the headquarters of SEMPRA. The city has a bunch of people that work in different parts of the city, not just in City Hall. They usually rent space for them. They decided several years ago they needed more. They needed more permanent, maybe buy a building. Uh, Sempra moved out of that building, 101 Ash Street. Uh, and they said, well, maybe we'll buy that building. They talked for years, talked for years. Uh, obviously, uh, it went badly. Uh, they bought the building in a lease-to-own uh, situation La yesterday, the San Diego City Council heard a lot of reasons about why that went so poorly, and they're basically stuck with a bunch of options that really stink that could cost the city upward of two, three hundred million dollars. They wanted to buy the building for seventy-two million dollars, two or three hundred million dollars. So we're gonna we have a great story coming out on that about on Monday or Tuesday. I'm not sure about the history. What went into that decision, how they bought it, and who made the money and who didn't. Uh, all right. Uh, one last thing I wanted to talk about. Politics. Andy Keats and I write the Politics Report every Friday. Just finished it this week. And this week's a roundup of fundraising reports from the last period. We were really excited to get these uh, numbers because these numbers would indicate uh, how these candidates did during... Uh, Historic pandemic. Really interesting numbers in there. I'm going to share one of them. Uh, 
This is the main race that we've all been following. This is District 3 of the San Diego County Supervisors. Kristen Gaspar is the incumbent. She's running against uh, Tara Lawson Reamer, a Democrat who won the, uh, won the uh, second spot in the primary against Olga Diaz, city councilwoman. Tara Lawson Reamer and Kristen Gaspar. Kristen Gaspar is the incumbent Republican. She's got a tough re-election campaign, but she's the incumbent. Incumbents usually do very well fundraising, but not this period. Look at this. Kristen Gaspar brought in just about $60,000. Tara Lawson Reamer brought in $301,000. We actually talked to Kristen Gaspar's consultant. He said, yeah, she didn't fundraise. She was busy with all the COVID stuff at the Board of Supervisors. She's got a small business. She's got a family. Didn't want to fundraise, did not think it was an important priority for her. Okay, fascinating in politics decision to make, but obviously I understand how busy life can be right now. Finally, I just wanted to pitch the podcast came out today, a Voice of San Diego podcast. Me, Andy Keats, Sarah Libby talk about uh, local politics, public affairs. We talked about that building. We talked about sedition. You remember last uh, episode, Wednesday, about the laws on that. And then we also talked about this phenomenon for public education. All right, and on that note, I want to bring in Morgan Appel. He is the oops. He is the dean of uh, the uh, Education and Community Outreach Department of the UC San Diego Extension. Uh, welcome, Morgan. How are you? I am doing wonderful, Scott. Uh, thank you for having me. And I think you've given me a little bit of a promotion. I'm actually the assistant, oh, assistant dean, dean of Education and Community Outreach. But if you wouldn't mind letting my bosses know, I'd be uh, very yeah. happy for that. So uh, thank you and welcome to my home. Yes. Uh, do you have any dogs that will bother us? Because we yes. can have them fight a little bit. No, no. I do have a dog who's always eager and in critical parts of a meeting. He will break in and he will bark as he hears voices coming out of the computer. So, yes, you can probably count on that. All right. Let's have a good uh, nerdy discussion about uh, education, about what's going on here, about how teachers and students can thrive in this reality. We've talked a lot about how scared we are of remote learning. I'm hoping you can take us around the corner uh, to feel a little differently about what's possible. Uh, let's first of all talk about what you do. Uh, what is the uh, Department of Education and Community Outreach and at UC San Diego Extension? Well, education and community outreach is the education and lifespan learning arm for um, University of California, San Diego Extension. And we provide uh, learning opportunities and community service for over 70,000 uh, students and participants across the globe. So we've been doing online education for quite a while, especially for teachers, probably for at least a decade or so, and can certainly understand the, the anxieties involved, not only for teachers, but for students and for parents. So we offer a wide portfolio that includes pre-college. We actually had all of our summer programming, had to make the rapid shift to move online. Uh, we also do programming for uh, teachers and community members, uh, licensure programs, as well as uh, programming for what we call active adults. So really you're talking uh, service for anywhere from pre-kindergarten all the way to post-retirement. Okay. Uh, my understanding is your services are being called upon right now. You've, you've got, uh, you're doing some work with some districts and teachers to help them get ready for this, uh, for this, uh, what's happening. What, describe to me how that's going, what's going on. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's going, and and we are a learning organization, so we learn along as we implement. But uh, when we saw COVID sort of on the longer horizon, so when we saw it probably in around March, we knew that this was not going to be a slow glide into remote learning. We knew that this was going to be a jarring shift, for which schools may not be prepared. And when I talk about schools, I'm not solely talking about teachers, but also administrators and parents and families and students. So what we started to do immediately is to marshal resources that would enable the, the transition to be a bit more seamless and a bit more friendly. Um, we have a, a teaching online certificate. We've had that for a number of years. So um, we sent up the flare and we gathered all of our instructional staff around and said, okay, how do we make this useful for schools uh, that 
need it with a sense of urgency, but how can we create resources that are evergreen? Because we understand that it may be a quick shift to remote learning now, but there may be a time that we go back and you may have to go back remote. So how do we create something that provides a foundation upon which everybody could build? So uh, we, we gathered our best and brightest and we tried to distill the vital elements of our teaching online certificate that we've had for years. And we were able to compact it down to a week at first. And now we are also able to deliver it um, within a day or within two days. But we also understood that it had to be contextually grounded. We understood that it had to be individualized for each teacher to, and also to accommodate the range of skills, abilities, and access. So we started to build that out. Uh, but on a parallel track, we also started to build out resources for parents. So you mentioned the the one week track. D just talk to me about that. That is um, that's a normal program you've had for a long time, right? Well, actually, our teaching online program takes about six months oh, at okay. least Got to it. complete. But what we were able to do at the very Got first it. is to take that program and really strip it down to the frame and say, what are the most essential things that teachers need to know how to do uh, and impl to implement this quickly? So no fluff, no waiting, let's get right down to basics. But the unique thing about this program is that it's iterative and it's consultative. So we don't go in with a product, an off the shelf product and say, here's your week long training. And once we go, uh, good luck to you. We always meet with uh, school personnel, district personnel, teachers up front to look at challenges, to look at priorities, to look at uh, relationships with, with parents and families and how we could factor in there. So what we are able to do is take this modular framework and adapt it so everybody gets the fundamentals, but in the way that they need it. Got it. So in, in essence, in short, you've been doing this work to help people learn how to teach online for quite some time. And now you've uh, realizing that thousands more people are going to need to get that. You're doing what you can to meet that demand. Absolutely. Absolutely. What is, what is the main principle or two of teaching online that you try to get across? You know, can you do that in 20 seconds here? <laughs> yeah, I, I think what we uh, try to do is we try to, first of all, we tap into teachers' creativity and, and attempt to reignite their passion for the profession, why they got into it in the first place. And in so doing, what we are able to do is uh, to uh, provide resources to take what they do face-to-face and capture that and put it to online. And uh, we provide them with foundations of online curriculum design and delivery because it's very different. You can't be a sage on stage for six hours in front of a webcam. It just doesn't work. Um, we uh, help them adapt to the online learning environment and provide them with advisement insofar as uh, resources that they can use to build community and to conduct assessment. And so really steep them well in use of instructional technology tools and media and ways to build collaborative learning opportunities. And the great thing about this opportunity is that it is platform agnostic. So schools that are using Google Classroom, we can accommodate. Schools that are using Zoom, we can accommodate. So really it's all about providing a viable framework to help them do their best teaching and do it in a different way. So I, I liked what you said there. Uh, you can't be on a, a sage on stage for mm -hmm. six hours a day. I think that's what a lot of people are really talking about right now is what can we expect from teachers and what can we expect from students as far as this kind of engaged screen uh, interaction and I think what you're hinting at there is that you guys have thought a lot about that balance. Yes, and we have for, for a number of years uh, up until this point. But we also really understood that this is only part of the equation. Uh, the other, there's other parts of the school community and our uh, conception of education is that if you're going to have informed conversations about teaching and learning, 
everybody has to speak a common language, albeit in different dialects. So you had parents who are struggling because they didn't know whether they had to replicate a classroom in their home. Uh, they didn't know what they had to do to best support their kids, how to deal with social emotional concerns. So as we were building out this programming for teachers, uh, we were also building out a series of compacted learning experiences through University of California television to support parents and families. Anything from setting up a, a home classroom to teaching kids about social distancing to activities that kids can do at home to support learning, how to have conversations with teachers, what can you expect. So we were working really on, on two parallel tracks at the same time. And um, we're in the process of finalizing uh, a similar program for administrators, uh, because these are instructional leaders who are used to governing a campus. And now all of their faculty and all of their students have scattered to the winds, but they are still responsible for their well-being. Yeah. Uh, I that's a interesting point um, uh, about the parents. What what is what what is available for for parents? I think a lot of us are are really struggling with that expectation rubric right now. Are we supposed to lower our expectations? Just get through this? Are we supposed to have similar expectations? What kind of expectations should one have about online education, and what can be? Um, conveyed and, and internalized. Well, and, and I think that's a, an incredibly important question because our shift um, was, was jarring. So really it was in, 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 the, in the first few weeks, the first few months, it was all about just surviving, just getting by. And when we would talk to teachers, you know, we thought they were going to be asking us, you know, uh, how do I best deliver science programming online in a way that's engaging? But uh, they would come to us and say, you know, parents are asking me, you know, how do I get on to, to Zoom? Or I keep clicking this button and nothing happens. So it really had to change the way we understood uh, the relationship between schools and teachers and parents. And I think as everybody was sort of getting used to things, you know, expectations uh, had to be changed. But I think moving forward, um, it counts now. So I think we really need to uh, expect much more from our, our, our schools and much more from our teachers. And uh, we are here to support them in, in that journey. We are here to be with them and to help them find solutions. So you, um, if there were a debate, I'm not sure there is, L uh, Lorena Gonzalez, an assemblywoman uh, who represents San Diego, of course, in Sacramento, mm -hmm. she has made the case a couple times on social media, very informally, that maybe we should just mail this year in, uh, you know, like uh, maybe do our best for enrichment, but uh, basically say like, okay, you start seventh grade over next year, or not over, just newly next year. Uh, I think that's a different level of expectations management um, than what we were just talking about, but it's similar. What would you say to that? Yeah, I, I think it's I, I think it's it's a very difficult and I think it's a complex question because you have different learning environments and different schools that are starting in in much different places. I don't think you could uh, make a, a universal claim that you know this is a throwaway year because you know we want to ensure that. Uh, you know, there is no, uh, or at least mitigate the impacts of what you might call the COVID slump. I think that there are phenomenal resources out there. And I think that the program that we offer both for, for teachers and for parents are part of a larger mosaic of professional development that is available. Um, our, our profession, we haven't charged for ours at all for teachers or for parents um, because, you know, as a uh, research university with a service mission. Uh, we believe that that is our obligation to our publics. But I think that the greatest problem that people are experiencing first, you know, first was the quest for resources. When this first happened, everybody was looking to find anything and everything that they could. Now we realize that there is an overabundance 
of resources, not all of them vetted, um, not all of them uh, reliable operators. So one of the things that we take very seriously in our role is to curate and, and to vet those types of resources and to also understand that there, there are, there's a tapestry of uh, support that's available and to figure out where we fit. So uh, when we uh, approach schools and we approach districts and uh, in looking to work with them, we'll always ask, what are you doing right now? Where can we fit? Are we filling in gaps? Do you need the, the whole thing? Because um, again, our, our emphasis is to work with teachers individually to contextually ground what we do and to really uh, speak truth to power about differentiating the way that we work in teaching and learning. And I think ultimately, we at least want to provide a solid foundation, a level field from which everyone can grow. And I think once we're able to do that, then we can move forward uh, with deliberate speed. I think uh, one thing that's interesting, and and I'm an online entrepreneur in a way. I've created an information source online, uh, this Voice of San Diego uh, news outlet, and I, I and there's some things that are very similar to what we do, uh, what has always been done in journalism, you know, a daily cycle, these kinds of things. And then there are some things that are vastly different, um, that are you know um, different ways to engage audiences based on what online can and can't do, uh, what online events like this can and can't do. I wonder if there are any specific differences that really come to mind that um, happen with online education. I think one thing that's fascinating about what the city schools are, are doing right now is making decisions about replicating the physical environment, the physical classroom, online or, or remotely and managing even the daily schedule in a similar daily rhythm that seems like where they're heading and i wonder if there's what what you've learned about what works with recreating physical landscapes and what doesn't as they make these decisions yeah i i think really it's 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 all over the board i think um you, you know as as well as i do in um, you know, entrepreneurship is all about uh, solving problems and, and figuring out ways uh, to do things successfully. So, for example, you know, one of the things that I think that a lot of schools were concerned about, although it may not have been a primary concern, was the ability to uh, uh, sponsor community events or to be able to, to share what they were doing. They had to close it all down because these were things that were typically done in person. So, uh, you know, we put our minds to it to figure out ways that that could be done virtually. So when we're talking about uh, providing um, online support, online resources, we're not solely talking about learning platforms and learning management systems. Uh, we have a, a, a vast resource in the University of California television where we are able to uh, do a, a lot of work toward that end. And I think, you know, we're all figuring this out together. We're all figuring out now what works and what doesn't work. And I think there's going to be a lot of trial and error. And I think that there are best practices emerging. For example, uh, you know, spending uh, time one on one with students. How to fig how do we figure out uh, the the um, special education IEP uh, sort of um, sort of, of challenges that we face? But um, I think it for different sites and, and different districts, different things work. And that's precisely why we work in ways that really attend to the needs and histories and contexts of individual schools. We've got um, a, a teacher in here, a friend of mine, I know her, Molly Beth Stewart. She says, you're awesome. Congrats oh, on that. You, there are always worse things to, worse ways to be described. Uh, yes, uh, and I have and, been. And I have been. <laughs> oh, me too. Trust me. Uh, this week, in fact, UC San Diego provides, she says, classes for unified uh, programs so that teachers can clear their credentials. And she, she says uh, later, she has a, a more direct question. Uh, how much time should students be spending a day online? Now, I know she teaches uh, kindergarten and, and TK. But that's obviously a much different type of, of person than a seventh grader or a 10th mm -hmm. grader. 
But do we have any of those kind of principles you could share that you've learned? You know, it's 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 interesting and uh, that that you mentioned that because just prior to the the pandemic, just uh, prior to its rearing its ugly head, I was actually um, working with groups of parents about social media and technology addiction, finding ways to get kids off screen, get them yeah. away from the screen. Right. Um, you know, they were worried about social media. They were worried, and and you know, all of the all of the you know uh, st the studies about online engagement are really sort of studies in neuroscience. And we know a lot about attention levels, and we know that there are benefits uh, to to being uh, apart from the screen. We know that there are benefits to physical activity. So it's 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 difficult to say because you know I think. As you know, I can tell you from my experience in in teaching online um, that uh, you know there's for if you look at our uh, programming on UCTV, which gets pushed to social media, we know that there is sort of a 15 minute attention span that most people can can stand uh, being engaged. But it's certainly different because our uh, the work that you can do on Zoom and in other platforms, you can create collaborative and engaging environments where kids are working together. I think really the principles of good online teaching are the same as the principles of good teaching. And we ask that our teachers engaged in this pursuit really reconnect with those principles of good pedagogy. And really, if you look at good teaching, Good teaching is a form of art. It's more art than it is science. And we see that teachers work in the same way that artists do. Um, so I think it really takes an ability to, uh, you know, think quickly on your feet to know when something's not going, going right and to switch it up. Um, and we just have to figure out how do we do that in a virtual environment? Uh, let's stay with that for a second. I, I think there were a lot of teachers who did some really special things. And there were a lot of profiles about some teachers that did some really special things, went out of their way, went to, found ways to find alternatives to connecting with their students. And there were others, I think we should all be honest, who really struggled, who weren't mm -hmm. comfortable with online platforms, who had been doing you know, great work for a long time in a much different setting. Um, and you know, uh, were suddenly thrust this challenge um, I think that there are probably a lot of educators, as I would be going into this year, really nervous, mm -hmm. really nervous about expectations that their community has, really nervous about their own standards, and really nervous about uh, interacting with the, with the kids and with the different levels of students. What would you tell them about everybody's ability to handle this? Uh, the, you know, we all had to learn the internet at some point and, and what would you tell them to give them a little bit more confidence then? Well, first of all, what, what I would tell them is, uh, your, your, your anxieties are understandable and, and it's not solely revolving around, uh, a transition to remote learning. Anytime routine is disrupted, it causes uh, ang ambiguity, which causes anxiety and and discomfort. So, you know, people uh, are 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 enamored with routine because it's predictable and it's safe, and you know what to expect. So, I think that everybody involved in this endeavor, all of the stakeholders, uh, not only got the the sort of the 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 shock of the pandemic and the you know the sudden shift to remote learning but they also experienced an incredible disruption of routine and everybody's sort of trying to come back, find their equilibrium. So I will say, number one, I'm a guy who said uh, back in the early 90s that there's nothing a computer can do that my electronic typewriter can't. So, um, you know, you're, you're, you're preaching to the choir here. I've, I've been there. Um, I was a, a laggard, a technological laggard at one point, but, um, you know, my department was faced uh, with, uh, you know, I, our, our on-campus enrollments getting smaller and opportunities opening up across the state and across the globe. So we had to make the shift. And uh, certainly I would say your anxieties are understandable, but I would also say, look, you're not alone in this. 
Um, you can count on us. You can count on uh, University of California, San Diego. You can count on Extension. You can count on education community outreach to be your partners in this. We get it. We understand. And, you know, as I mentioned, our program is designed to attend to different skills, abilities, aptitudes, and access. We've had, uh, you know, people who have attended our trainings um, who could send an email, maybe print out a document, and that's about it. But, you know, we were able to uh, attend to their individual needs, their individual trepidations, and then and guide them through to provide them with enough competence to instill a sense of confidence. Because what we're also attempting to do, and this is what we always encourage our teachers to do with kids, is to cultivate a sense of resilience and a sense of growth mindset. Uh, so I would say to teachers, don't let anybody tell you that you can't do that uh, because you can. Um, Teaching remotely is doable, um, but everybody needs a little help. And and as somebody who, you know, I'm not an educator necessarily. I think of what we do as a type of education, a mm -hmm. civic education. But I think that um, if I I could add some points to that, Please. it's like you you can also be not perfect. You need to give yourself permission to not be perfect. You're going to, your dog's going to bark yes. like mine did. And if, the, if you let that hold you back as you endeavor on this, if that, if that need to be perfect uh, is in that, in the way you're going to struggle and it's going to be a really difficult experience. And you just got to let sometimes things not be perfect, not be, you know, have a blemish to me talking with Morgan Appel right now is much worse, more worth it than getting some sort of perfect production, you know, that I wouldn't want to talk to him about to get this across. You guys and us having this conversation is that important. And so I think I would just add that, that um, do your best, learn as much as you can, but sometimes there's going to be some blemishes and it's okay. And, and as there should be in your face-to-face -face classes, there are blemishes. There are right, always blemishes. Exactly. There are always imperfections. And, uh, you know, one of the social emotional issues that we deal with with a number of students is trying to attend to their perfectionist tendencies because uh, right. it leads to exaggerated self expectations. And, you know, when you're trying to do something without one slip up, you wind up slipping up. Uh, and I think that we need to uh, give teachers latitude uh, to give themselves a break to say, yeah, oh, sure. You know what? Uh, and I will tell you teachers, from somebody who is teaching online, teaching teachers online and addressing large crowds of parents online, you know, there are times when I'm about to make a spectacular point, or at least one that I think is spectacular, and the whole thing goes out. You know, <laughs> there is a, the, yeah. the, the internet disconnects, uh, and I'm, I'm sort of sitting there talking to myself, frantically trying to reconnect. So it, 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 it does happen and um, you should expect to make mistakes. Otherwise, you're, you're not gonna be able to adjust practice. So give yourselves a break, have faith in yourselves. You know, we've always said that, you know, teaching is more calling than it is career. People are called to this. They have an innate sensibility around this. They know what they're doing. And if they allow themselves to, to teach as they like to be taught, and uh, engage kids, get to know their kids really well. Um, you know, understanding your, your kids in depth doesn't need to happen face to face. It can happen in any environment. And if you are a good teacher, you are a good teacher in California, you are a good teacher in New Hampshire, and you are a good teacher online. And, and that's really the basics. You know, as, as you would, you know, uh, or talk about baseball, talk about football, stick to the fundamentals. Go, always go back to the fundamentals and build. Uh, that's, that's a great, that's a really great message. Uh, one other point uh, that's so important about schools and especially physical schools is community. You know, yeah. uh, my school has a tradition that we get up. And every morning when before school, they sing, they, they will not sing, they sing every Friday, but they have a, a gathering where the parents gather with the kids every morning, the principal gives announcements and, um, you know, sometimes kids are recognized and, and then the parents leave. Sometimes they have coffee there 
And that's, that's gone. And that's one of the saddest parts of this whole thing is like, I don't know when I'm ever going to share coffee again with my fellow, you know, people I wouldn't normally interact with and, and that we all share a purpose. And so I think a lot of us are really sad about that. And yeah, so I think, uh, what I tried, what I, what I'd love to hear is what you might've learned about recreating community. Should it be done according to those constraints about school sites? Should it be more broad? Should it be more interest directed? Or should should we just do our best in each place? I, I'm just curious what your thoughts are. Well, yeah, and, and I uh, certainly uh, feel the same way you do. I'm on a campus, I was on a campus of 70,000 every day, or uh, maybe not that many, but you know, between 40 and 50,000. It was a viable and vibrant community like a city. And you know, you used to walking through campus and, and seeing students and kind of uh, admiring the buildings and and sort of really getting a, a campusy feel. So, uh, you know, I certainly miss that. Even a face-to-face meetings, which I used to dread, sorry, colleagues, but um, uh, that I used to dread, I'm, I really realize how much I miss them and I miss the, the small things. So I think uh, one of the things that, that, that we've endeavored to do in, in our work with teachers and with parents is to try to find ways to create communities virtually. If we're unable to do it physically, uh, we try to uh, avail ourselves of technologies that not only build community, but also provide opportunity for peer engagement. So what we have been doing in our Teaching Online Essentials uh, workshops is we have been using a social learning platform called Flipgrid, where each of the teachers with whom uh, we've uh, provided uh, the workshop, they go on and they record some thoughts, some ideas, talk about what they've done, talk about what they've learned, uh, you know, the projects that they've done in the course, and they post that online uh, through this this platform. And what that empowers uh, these, these teachers to do is to go on and access peers. So we've, I think, served approximately, I want to say between 3,000, maybe 3,200 teachers thus far. And what we've been able to do is build up a, a small wall of practitioners who have all been engaged in teaching online essentials and who have uh, done work in, in their subject area. Some have focused on social emotional needs. Some have focused on presentation skills and things like that. But what it does is it provides a virtual community. So if you are a struggling teacher in Stockton, wondering how to get your kids motivated to do math at home, there is probably a, you know, a, a struggling teacher in Santee who has addressed it. So I don't know if it's possible to recreate the experiences in their entirety. Uh, there's something to be said for the the, the tangible, you know, uh, being face to face. But what we do is we come close. And I think that I don't think that these need to be interest focused. I think we try to replicate just as much as we would in, in our traditional lives uh, where we find community and seek out community. And the more uh, occasions that we can provide opportunities for people to convene, so much the better. Although I'm also very cognizant of this whole, uh, you know, uh, streaming fatigue or, yeah. or or Zoom fatigue. So we're no longer, um, uh, you know, working from home. We're sort of living at work, and I think um, that uh, you know we also have to be cognizant of of that. And and it's hard because. The whole, the, the whole landscape shifted. And just as we're finding our footing, it starts to, to shake up a bit again. And we, we struggle to find, find balance and find equilibrium. Uh, I mean, I couldn't tell you how happy I was when you know our, our, uh, our barbershop said, okay, we're open for business, come on in. And I went, okay, I'm gonna just get the haircut to end all haircuts, but I'm not gonna worry because we've, you know, we've moved over this, this hump as it were. And it turns out uh, two weeks later, it's it's yeah. it's back. But, you know, you sort of readjust and you balance. That's the great thing about about humans is that they can adapt. They can um, uh, re rethink things. 
So, yeah. well, this isn't the last that Mother Nature is going to throw at us over the next few decades or, or centuries. So, better get used to it. Um, okay, let's talk specifically about what you're offering and yes. how how teachers and parents can access it. And just on behalf of everybody, thanks for making it free, you said, uh, right? Um, that is at, absolutely correct, yes. Okay, well, let us uh, know where it's at, uh, and, and we can post some of the links as well. So what do you have, and, and how can they access it? So uh, the, our Teaching Online Essentials is a, a program that can be accessed by schools or, or school districts or individual teachers. And it, uh, there are a variety of different formats. Our, our typical format is a uh, week-long training where there is a, a sort of a live on Zoom two hours on Monday morning and live on Zoom closing Friday. Uh, during the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, it is uh, sort of an independent learning with an instructor who guides you through uh, and is available by text or by telephone. We also have uh, versions of the trainings that are day long, two days long. So we are build to suit. So whatever schools or whatever districts need, we can accommodate. And we are happy to integrate your challenges, integrate uh, your emphases or what have you. And if you're interested in uh, those opportunities, I do encourage you to please contact me directly by email uh, and I will uh, give that out to you in just a second. Uh, for parents, uh, we offer uh, similar trainings through our parent university. So if you are part of a parent group or uh, if you are part of a PTA, uh, we can also provide uh, similar resources uh, live uh, through Zoom or another platform. But we also have a, um, a, a plethora of resources available through our STEAM channel at UC. TV. So that's uctv.tv. And if you go to the Steam channel, uh, we have over 50 videos and counting, each about 15 minutes in length, uh, ranging from topics about teaching kids about social distancing to what to expect from college uh, in, in the era of COVID to providing uh, a safe learning, safe and engaging learning environment uh, for your kids at home. Uh, staying sane, providing social emotional support. That's all available 24 hours a day through the Steam channel at UCTV, UCTV.tv. And I will give you my email address. If you're interested uh, as a school community, uh, please let me know. I am Morgan Appel. I'm Assistant Dean for Education and Community Outreach. And my email is M as in Morgan, A. P is in Peter, P is in Peter, E L. So it's like Apple with the last two reversed at ucsd.edu. And uh, I will respond within two hours, no matter what time of day. Well, thank you, Morgan Appel. Uh, th thank you for providing that service. Um, I, I suppose a lot of us have had trouble making that transition to where. I guess schools aren't going to open. Let's prepare for what's going to happen. And so, uh, you know, you seem to be on the front lines of making that transition with us and helping, uh, ready to help with that process. So, yeah, everybody who's with me on that, let's get a grip. <laughs> it happened. It's closed. Uh, what are we going to do to make this the best possible experience? And uh, um, uh, uh, thank you for, for providing that service. Absolutely. We'll take these steps together, Scott. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Yeah, thank you. All right. Well, we've posted some of those uh, in there. Check that out. Um, and I'm particularly interested in some of that PTA stuff. Uh, uh, my wife was deeply involved with that. And, and I, yeah, I just want to uh, elaborate on that point. You know, I think a lot of us just need to deal with, uh, with a little bit of trauma here. Um, uh, we had a, actually a trauma training in the in the office about specifically about journalism and and some of the trauma that our journalists have to deal with. You know, they're they're talking with sexual assault victims and crime victims and uh, people who have uh, uh, are alleging things about uh, police or authorities. And so it you know those stories can really weigh on people. So we try to have these um, trainings uh, and really a great guy out of uh, um, 
I, I'll, I'll get his name, we'll post it. But um, he, uh, he, he does a, a lot of uh, um, explaining about what, what, how to work, how your brain works through this, how to think through this. And I think he's made a point a couple of times that you're dealing with, uh, often with trauma, a, uh, um, a kind of uh, um, feeling of a, of a connection that's been broken, of a social contract that was broken. You know, whether somebody let you down, somebody in authority let you down, or, or just the society, things that you expect out of the society, having food available or something, um, you know, that when those things are broken, when those uh, things that you can rely on are, are lost, then uh, you're, you can often be dealing with an actual trauma. And recognizing that I think is really important. I think we're all, we've all gone through a trauma. And I think part of what, what we've experienced is that we spent so much time, and I think a lot of you will agree, like ha have similar takes on spending so much time with your school community, uh, with the PTA, with the meetings, with the, 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 you know, the events, the fundraising, um, you know, just the conversations about worries, um, you know, whether there's little things about rats or about, uh, you know, bigger things about special education, availability, uh, projects, you know, you, you work on a community, a community like that, a successful school community is a elaborate long-term project that parents hand and, and teachers hand off to each other over time. And I think what we all have to deal with is that that has been just rupture that has been broken. So we just, we have to deal with that. You know, we have to recognize that that's unfortunate and that that's something that um, we should work on rebuilding. But in the meantime, we've got a job to do now. We've got to switch. We've got to, we've got to realize that for now, we've got to put the time into making what virtual opportunities we have work and then also giving people and each other a break on what's expected um you know at home you need to give yourself a break about how hard it's going to be and at schools we need to give ourselves a break about how um, imperfect it might be but we all understand everybody's struggling we all understand that parents are struggling we all understand that teachers are so let's accept that each person has what a lot going on and let's just give each other a break and do our best to uh to help people understand how to take advantage of this time how to do our best and then we can get back to rebuilding that community and those things that we built over those many years and hand it off to each other and uh the sports and the fun things and we'll i think look at those things in a light that uh is really nice so for now, let's just spend that time and build that. And I'll be along there with you for the ride and, and we'll keep talking about it. Let us know if you have any questions uh, or anything left at uh, to, to go over. And uh, also you saw the ad on the previous screen, PolitiFest is happening this year, September 29th through October 3rd. Tickets will go on sale on August 17th and there will be many ways to get those if you can't afford them. Uh, but uh, obviously, that's we got to pay for a lot of the work we're doing too. So if you have that opportunity, it'd be great. Also, next week, Wednesday, August twelfth, we're gonna have a special town hall with some special guests: uh, Richard Barrera from the San Diego Unified uh, School Board, uh, Betsy Lynch, who runs the CEO. She's the CEO of the Lawrence Family Jewish Community Center. They're launching an all-day camp, a school, not school. Uh, and then we've got a few others we're working on to bring in to have a great discussion about all these things that are coming up uh, and then all of these uh, concerns and, and worries we may need to deal with as we build them. Uh, thanks again for joining. I'm going to go watch the Padres and uh, I hope you all have a good weekend. We'll talk to you on Wednesday of next week.